The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. On tonight's program, it is our pleasure to present Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who will speak to you from Washington, D.C. We have stated that this program is presented by the Equitable Life Assurance Society as a public service. This applies not only to the program itself, but to the commercials. All Equitable Society messages are designed to be of service to you, to point out ways and means by which you can give greater security to your loved ones, to keep you informed on present-day developments in insurance. For instance, tonight's Equitable Society message is on a type of insurance which touches the lives of 50 million Americans. Yet most of the 50 million know little or nothing about it. So it will pay you, in just 14 minutes to listen to the message on group insurance from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, The Indifferent Mother. Every law enforcement agency in the nation is faced with many seemingly eternal problems. And when, as sometimes happens, those problems appear in pairs, then the path to a solution becomes that much more difficult. Juvenile delinquency, always a major problem, has recently become entwined with one of America's most serious crimes, auto theft. In a recent study made by your FBI of the field of crime during the first six months of this year, one figure stood out. That figure was the total value of automobiles stolen during those six months. And that figure was more than $31 million. The night's file opens in an apartment located in one of the residential sections of an eastern city. Alice Roberts, a slim, pretty, teenage girl, is just entering her mother's bedroom. Hi, Mom. Hello, Alice. Hey, what are you getting all dressed up for? Are you going out? Yes, please don't bother me now, dear. But, Mama... Will you... Alice, stop stammering, dear. What do you want? Well, I... I was just hoping you'd be home tonight to help me with my dress. What dress? My costume. Darling, will you stop talking in riddles? What costume? The costume I'm wearing in the school play tomorrow. Oh. Is that tomorrow? Well, yes. Oh, Mother, don't tell me you're not coming. Why, I'll stop. Now, Alice, don't be dramatic. But, Mother... I have a date to go to a matinee tomorrow with Mrs. Williams. But you can always see a matinee... But tomorrow's the only time we're giving the school play. Now, Alice, Mrs. Williams would be very offended if I called at the last minute. But you knew about the school play a month ago. Well, I, I'm sorry, darling. I just <laughs> forgot about it. Oh, now, don't start that, Alice. Oh, Mother, please listen to me. Why, everybody else's parents will be there. You've got to come. You just got Alice. to. Now, how do I look? Huh? I asked you, how do I look? Oh, well... You look okay. Oh, thank you, dear. Well, I've got to be going. You'd better let me sleep late in the morning, dear. I'll be home quite late tonight. Oh, good luck tomorrow, darling, with your play. That ain't the reason. You got the same trouble I have. What do you mean? Your mother didn't show up. Mine didn't either. Isn't that it? She didn't even send any flowers. Oh, look, honey, what do you care? Don't you? I don't pay any attention to those things anymore. I'm used to them. But well, don't you feel funny when your own mother doesn't care enough to show up? Well, it used to bother me, but why ride with it now? 
My mother lives her life, I live mine. You want to do the same thing. I don't understand, Flo. Well, it's simple. You're a pretty girl, like me. Lots of fellows would like to go out with you. My mother doesn't let me go out. Is she going to be home tonight? No. She's got a date to go someplace to a party. Well, that's fine. Then why don't you come home with me for dinner? I got a date tonight. I'll have him get a friend for you. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just greeting Ned Hamilton, a policeman attached to the local force. Now, pull up a chair, Ned. Oh, thanks, Jim. Hey, uh, congratulations on winning that pistol shooting contest. You beat some pretty good shots. Oh, thanks. I've got a problem, Jim, that calls for something more than being a good shot. Oh, what's your trouble? Do you know how many automobiles are stolen every day in this town? Well, I know it's quite a few. Well, there's a new angle on it now. Oh, what's that? Young kids are stealing some of them. Oh, but that's always happened, Ned. Mm, not this way, Jim. In the old days, any car stolen by a kid would be used for a joyride and then abandoned. Yeah, that's right. These cars are disappearing. What? I've got a list here of motor and serial numbers on cars that have been stolen and haven't turned up anywhere. Well, then they must be selling them someplace, Ned. But who'd buy a car from a kid? I wish I knew. That's what I came up to see you about. You think there's an FBI violation someplace? Yes. You see, we picked up one of the kids who stole a car. Get anything from him? Not much. He's only 16, but he's got that misguided notion about honor among thieves, so he wouldn't talk. What about his parents, Ned? Have you spoken to them? Mm-hmm. They asked us to keep the kid in jail. It's a nice attitude. To make the story even nicer, the kid was drunk when he was picked up. How could a kid that age get whiskey in this town? He didn't. He got it out at Aunt Clara's. Aunt Clara? Who's that? Well, she runs a juke joint across the state line. That's why I can't touch her. Oh, but I know that high school kids from all over the town go out there, and the place is one of the biggest contributors to juvenile delinquency that we have. That name, Aunt Clara, is very deceptive. So is she. I'd like to see that place. I, uh, I wish you would, Jim. Just run out and take a look for yourself. Okay, I think I will. Well, where's that list of serial numbers on the stolen cars? Oh, there you are, Jim. Thanks. I'll send out an alarm on these at once. Aunt Clara. Hello there, son. Come on over. Hi, Aunt Clara. Hello, Ricky boy. Sit down. Sit down. Thanks. How about a nice big slice of homemade pie? Made with Aunt Clara's own loving hands. I, I ain't hungry, thanks. Well, what's on your mind, Ricky boy? Well, I got a date tonight. That's nice. Anybody I know? Yeah, Flo Duncan. Is that the little blonde you had out here Sunday night? Yeah, that's the one. Say, she's real cute. Yeah, I think so, too. Rick! Kids over in booth four want more beer. Keep your eyes open, boy. Aunt Clara. Yes, sir. I, I kind of got the shorts. I need some cash. About 50. <laughs> That's a nice number. Can I have it? From me? Yeah. Now, Ricky boy, your account is overdrawn. Well, I can't be. You haven't turned in a car in a month. You've given a lot of parties since then. But, Aunt Clara, I told you, I got a date. What time is your date? I'm picking Flo up in front of her house at 8.30. Well, it's only 6.30 now. Look, Ricky, why don't you be a smart little boy? You've got two hours. Go into town and steal yourself another car. Received word at headquarters you wanted to see me. That's right, Ned. We got pretty quick action on that list of stolen cars that you gave us. Oh, what have you got? Well, the Cleveland office made a raid yesterday and broke up a big stolen car ring that was operating out of there. One of the cars they found in the garage was on your list. Well, any idea how they got the car to Cleveland? No, none so far, but the Cleveland office is working on that. And from what they teletyped to us, it's indicated the ring got cars from local agents all over the country. Then they changed the car's numbers and sold it. That's it. Hmm. Oh, Jim, did you get out to Aunt Clara's? Yes, 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 I did. I just looked around, though. The place was teeming with kids, and all of them drinking quite heavily. Did you see anything that tied in with the stolen cars? No, no, I didn't. But if this Aunt Clara is tied in with that racket, she's going to be a difficult one to trip up. Yeah, I know. Ned, it'll probably take the Cleveland office a couple of weeks to go through all of the papers they seized when they made that raid. So my suggestion is we keep our eyes open at this end. Okay. As soon as you get word in the next car that's reported stolen, we'll go to work. Okay, okay, we're coming. Hi, 
Hi, Ricky. Hi. Hope you weren't waiting long. We didn't finish dinner Who's until... Who's she? Huh? Oh, this is a girlfriend of mine, Alice Roberts. Alice, this is Ricky Hill. Very happy to meet you. Hi. Get in, huh? Okay, you get in first, Alice. Wait a minute, she's coming? Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. I thought maybe you could get a date for her. Can you, Rick? Well... Oh, look, Flo, I really don't care to force myself. Get in, there'll be guys fighting over you before the night's over. Oh, Flo. Going? Out to Aunt Clara's. Oh, swell. Is that the place on the old mill road? Yeah, a very sophisticated place. Flo, does he have to drive this fast? But don't worry about Rick's driving. He's very conservative. Yeah, but... Oh, quit beefing, will you? Sorry. Where'd you dig her up? Oh, we go to school together. We were in the school play. Uh-huh. I have a program of the play right here if you'd like to see it. I'm driving. Well, you might know some of the kids Rick, are... do you hear that? Uh-huh. It's a motorcycle, Cyrus. Yeah, it's a cop. Well, he's after us, Rick. We're not going to stop. Oh, Rick, don't be foolish. He's bound to catch us. Not when I open this thing up. Oh, don't make him stop. I can't. This ain't my car. Oh, Rick, whose is it? I don't know. I, I stole it. Oh, what? Oh, Rick, he's pulling alongside. You've got to stop. Oh, no, I don't. Oh, Rick. Oh, you, you hit him. How else could I get away? Oh, you can't leave him there. Shut up. We're going to Aunt Clara's. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Now a 50-second interview on group insurance with a man who's recently had a lot of sickness in his family. Isn't that so, Sam? Sure is, Mr. Keating. Within six months, my kids had mumps and measles. Then my wife caught pneumonia... And all the rest of us came down with the flu. Oh, that was tough going, Sam. I'll bet you owe a mint of money to your doctor. No, sir. I don't owe Doc Smalley one red cent. Where I work, we've got complete group insurance with the Equitable Society. And that even covers medical expenses for you and your family? You bet it does. Well, we had 20 visits from Doc Smalley, not counting the times we went to his office. But checks from the Equitable Society paid the Doc faster than he's ever been paid before. Yes, group insurance with the Equitable Society was a mighty good thing for you, Sam. And it's just as good for your company for three good reasons. First, it means satisfied, loyal workers. Yeah. Think of getting life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and retirement income, plus hospital, surgical, and medical benefits, all in one package from the Equitable Society, without any medical examination. Second, group insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society decreases labor turnover. All oh, right. A fellow thinks twice before he walks out on a job which gives him extra insurance coverage at far lower cost than he could buy it as an individual. Third, Equitable Society group insurance improves quality and quantity of production. Believe me, I do better work now that I've got rid of all those worries about sickness and accidents and my wife and kids' future. Well, I hope every employer in this radio audience hears what you've said and that every one of them is resolving now to get the facts on complete group insurance protection from an Equitable Society expert. Get in touch with the nearest office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or write direct to the New York home office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Indifferent Mother. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI gradually illustrates how easy it is for the most innocent youngster to get into trouble. How very important it is that every child be given as much parental guidance as possible. Because without that guidance, without that pillar to lean on, any young boy or girl can easily become involved in any one of a series of major crimes. Children don't just grow. They must be helped. And in helping them, you help fight the greatest problem American law enforcement officers face today. The problem of juvenile delinquency. The night file continues at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is studying a later report from the Cleveland field office about the stolen car gang when the telephone rings. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Oh, hello, Jim. Ned Hamilton. Oh, hello, Ned. I'm down at the city hospital. Hey, what happened to you? Oh, nothing. I came down here to get some information from a patient. Oh. 
Well, who's that? One of our motorcycle patrolmen who was chasing a car out on the old post road tonight. As he pulled alongside, the car swerved and knocked him into a ditch. What happened to him? Broken leg and severe contusions. But he's conscious. I, I just spoke to him. Hmm. He got the license number of the car, and I checked it. Stolen? Yes. He was being driven by a young boy. There were three kids in the car, and he recognized one of them, the young girl. Oh, who was she? She was a girl who sang in a school play out at Washington High School this afternoon. Patrolman saw the play because his daughter was in it, too. What was the girl's name who was in the car? Alice Roberts. Mm -hmm. Have you sent an alarm on the car yet? Yes, just before I called you. Well. Whoever the kid was, he stole a car he can go a long way with. The man who owns it had just put four brand new tires on it less than a half hour before it was stolen. Ned, have you got an address on this Roberts girl? Yes, she lives at uh, 410 North Adams Street. 410 North Adams. I'll go out there right now. And, Ned, when I finish, I'll meet you at the hospital. You got a minute? I've got to see you. Sure, Ricky boy. What's on your mind? We had an accident. What kind of an accident? I was coming out here with a heap and a cop started to chase me. Did you shake him off? Better than that. What do you mean? He was on a motorcycle. I let him get alongside him and then I swerved and he went into a ditch. Well, what did you do with the car? I drove it into the basement downstairs. Ricky boy, are you crazy? You want to get everybody thrown into jail? What do you want me to do? Stop and get picked up? I want some protection. Where's your girl? She's down in the car, and there's another girl with us. What'll I do? Get back downstairs and wait for me. All right, Alice, I'm coming. Oh. Hello. I thought it was my daughter. She's always losing her key. Are you Mrs. Roberts? Yes, that's right. My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Oh. Here are my credentials. The FBI? What do you want here? It's about your daughter, Alice. Alice? Where is she? I don't know where she is, Mrs. Roberts. That's why I came here. What's happened to her? She was seen tonight riding in a stolen car along the old post road. In a... St oh, oh, that can't be true, Mr. Taylor. She's in the school play at Washington High School tonight. That school play was held this afternoon. It was? Yes. It's odd. I, I was sure it was tonight. Mrs. Roberts, did she say where she was going tonight? Well, I didn't ask her. I, I haven't the faintest idea. Well, can you give me the name of some of her close friends? They might know. Well, I I don't really know any of Alice's friends. Mm -hmm. Well, then can you tell me where your daughter likes to go when she goes out? Why, I... Well, how would I know? Well, girls usually tell their mothers about things like that. Yes, but Especially I... if the mothers show any interest. Oh, I... Oh, my poor baby. A little late for that, Mrs. Roberts. However, if you'll try to help me, we'll do everything we can to find her. I want to go home. Oh, look, Alice, we'll be going home soon. But I want to go home now. You'll go home when we do. Rick, don't you talk to her that way. I'll talk to her any way I like. Stand the chatter. Here comes Aunt Clara. Well, what are you doing, Ricky boy? Robbing the cradle. Look, Flo is all... I mean the other one. What's she crying for? Her mother? No, she felt sorry for the cop on the motorcycle and wants to call the police. It serves you right, Ricky boy. I've told you a dozen times. It's always better to work alone. Well, I did the job alone. I picked them up after. You should have delivered the car before you picked them up. Well, it's too late for that now. What will I do next? What do you do with us? Please, dear. One thing at a time. Rick, the first thing to do is to get rid of the car. Okay. Now put the girls in my office and we'll lock them in while you're gone. Right. And don't go near the garage with that car. It's too hot. Just take it out on the road someplace and leave it. And when you come back, I'll let you know what I've decided about the girls. <laughs> Sorry I made you wait this long. Yeah, that's okay, Jim. I just finished talking to the patrolman's doctor. Uh -huh. Oh, I went out and saw that girl's mother. Could she give you any help? No, not a bit. You know, I can understand why her daughter is out with the kind of company she's keeping. She's just letting that girl grow up by herself. Yeah, I know the type. One thing puzzles me, though. I spoke to the patrolman's daughter after I spoke to you. She swore this Alice Roberts is a fine girl. Well, if she is with that kind of a mother, it's a miracle. 
Oh, have you spoken to your office since you talked to me? Yes, I called them just before I came down to meet you. Yeah. They uh, found the car that the motorcycle patrolman was chasing. They did? Where? About five miles the other side of the state line. Did you get the exact location? Yes, I did. Well, come on, Ned. I'd like to take a look at that car. Find anything inside the car, Jim? Just this program from the show that was given at Washington High School this afternoon. Oh. It uh, has Alice Roberts' name on it. Well, it proves she was in the car, all right. Yeah. Well, the car wasn't left here too long ago, either. The motor's still warm. Any fingerprints inside? None that are good enough to help us. Well, I guess this dent here is where the motorcycle hit. Yes, it's fresh dent. The scratches are still clean. Well, at least we're getting a little closer to whoever did the job. We couldn't have missed him by very much. Matt, how about the state trooper who found the car? Did he give you anything? No, I was just talking to him. He didn't see anybody around here. How do you happen to be on a dirt road like this? Well, the farmer who owns that field saw the car and called the state police barracks. Oh, I see. Trooper made a complete inspection of the ground, followed a set of man's footprints up the dirt road, but he lost them when they reached the concrete highway. A set of man's footprints? Is that all? Yeah. Why? Well, that means he must have dropped the girls off someplace before he decided to get rid of the car. Yeah, that's right, Jim. Come on, let's take a look around up the outside of the car. I only went over the inside. Uh, let's use your flashlight, too, huh? Okay. Ed. What? There Yeah. Look down here. Oh, what is it? Didn't you tell me that these were brand new tires that the owner had just put on the car this afternoon? That's right. Now, you see those little bits of blue stone that are caught in the tire? Yeah. What about them? They could lead us to that missing trio. Clara comes down. She's running the show. I want to go home. Oh, quit that, will you? Hey, Arthur, Rick. Look, all she's done is beep and cry about wanting to go home. I want to go home, too. I don't like this any better than she does. Since when? Since you hit the cops. I like to have fun, but I didn't know you were stealing cars. So now you know. Yes, and I also know enough never to go out with you again. Well, Ricky boy, you got rid of the car, huh? Uh Uh-huh. Look, we want to get out of here. You're getting out of here. You're letting them go? No, but I'm getting rid of them. What do you mean? You girls are taking a little trip. And I think we should get ready for it right now. Uh, Ricky boy, I'll need your help. Okay. What is this? Well, you're going away, that's all. And I have something here that should make you sleep through the whole journey. Hold her first, Ricky. No. No, keep away from me. Shut up. Let go of me. Leave her alone, both of you. Who are you? Special agent of the FBI. Oh, thank huh? you. What are you doing here? I think that's obvious. Well, how did you know we were here? The car that was abandoned tonight had blue stones stuck in the tires. I remembered that the driveway here was covered with blue stones. Ricky, can you please take us home now? Well, there's a policeman upstairs who will take you home. I'm going to drive Aunt Clara here and a young friend down to jail. The woman known as Aunt Clara was tried, convicted, and given a 10-year sentence for violation of the Motor Vehicle Theft Act. Her young accomplice, Ricky Hill, was sentenced to a reformatory until he reaches majority. And now, This Is Your FBI brings you a message on juvenile delinquency from the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The next voice you hear will be that of Mr. J. Edgar Hoover speaking to you from Washington, D.C. My message tonight is directed to the mothers and fathers of America, to all adult citizens responsible for the welfare of our youth. During the war years, when age 17 was leading all other age groups in frequency of arrests, the volume of juvenile delinquency in the United States reached an all-time high. It was disheartening to see thousands of our youngsters caught in the backwash of war. But I had hopes then that the condition was temporary that after the war, the factors that contributed to delinquency would be removed and corrected. That apparently was wishful thinking. There was an encouraging decline in youthful delinquency immediately after the war. But arrests of youngsters are again on the increase. During the first nine months of 1947, arrests of boys 18 to 20 
years of age increased nearly 27% over the same period in 1946. Moreover, some of the wartime teenage offenders have grown up, and many are now committing more serious crimes. With a major crime occurring every 18 seconds, it is time to pause and examine the problem. I have noted that there is something lacking in the home life of most youngsters who violate the law. Even the delinquents, who are from apparently normal homes, are victims of parental neglect. The parents are either too careless or too busy with their own pleasures to give sufficient time, companionship, and interest to their children. I am convinced that a parent's gravest responsibility is to understand his children and win their confidence. Many fine, law-abiding parents actually do not know what their children are doing or how they spend their leisure time. When they find out, it is often too late. Their remorse does not remove the shame which their negligence has caused. Boys and girls are not hard to please. A little attention given to their problems and pleasure can mean so much. They violate the conventions of society because they are unhappy, because they feel insecure, and because they have not had the love and sympathy due them. Hence, my message is for the parents. Are you, the parents of our young people, doing everything in your power to develop your boys and girls into good citizens? Do you know your sons and daughters? Do you have their confidence? Are you acquainted with their friends? And do you know how they spend their leisure time? If you do not, I suggest that you take inventory and do what is necessary to make your home a place of learning as well as a place of living. A little more attention given to your child today may save the beginning of a life of degradation tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Hoover, for your telling and forthright message. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now some more useful facts on Equitable Society Group Insurance. It's a bargain for workers because it enables the company to give its employees the benefit of its wholesale purchasing power. It's a bargain for the management because it builds loyalty and goodwill, decreases personnel turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. For instance, the president of the Colgate Palmolive Peat Company, Mr. E.H. Little, says, Colgate Palmolive Peat Company, together with its employees, has recognized the advantages of group insurance protection. We believe that certain basic group plans are an important feature of a well-balanced industrial relations program. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your group program is incomplete, get in touch immediately with the nearest office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The colorful story of a cross-country quest for a stolen fortune. Its subject, bond theft. Its title, Lady Luck's Husband. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time. For this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>